Hello. Let's adjust this a tad. Looking all right. Yeah, back on the webcam tonight. Uh, nothing too special. Um, picture quality is looking all right, which is good. Uh, we've still got the microphone uh, connected. Um, and yeah, we're back on the webcam. I explained this on Instagram, but my main camera is currently in full repair. Um, the external microphone input jack on it uh, was faulty, has been for a little while. I've been avoiding getting it fixed because I knew it would take a couple of weeks and I'd always needed it for stuff. Uh, but now I'm in exams, so that's fine. I can put it in and get it fixed. Lockdown's not affected the time, uh, which is good. Um, so I should get it back in about a week and a half, something like that. Because I think I dropped it off on Tuesday, Wednesday, something like that. Um, but yeah, I was the microphone on the live streams was always connected to the computer, not the camera. And the ca camera was connected separately. I couldn't actually plumb any audio from the camera to the computer. I could just, oh, well, I guess I could, but through, eh. it would be complicated and it's easier to just plug it into the computer. So microphone, we've still got good quality sound, but we'll have to do with the uh, less quality than usual webcam. Uh, but yeah. Should be all right. We've got Herman in the chat. Herman, good to see you. Have as you said, it's been a while. Um, Dark Frosty says egg tastic. Yes, mate, egg tastic. Loving the egg references. And g'day Stephen, and g'day Will's train videos. We've got nine concurrent viewers at the moment, so. Yeah. Tonight's live stream is on the topic of railway electrics. Um, we're going to be focusing on the technical side of railway electrics and I'm going to be giving you the basics. Um, we are going to be talking about a few equations and stuff, um, but don't let that deter you. Excuse any background noise that you can hear. Um, family is cooking up some sort of dessert, I think, in the kitchen. Um, and my study is right next to the kitchen, so. Uh, but, yes. Um, yeah, we're, we're going to... I'll try to step you through it as... Um, as thoroughly as possible without trying to confuse you. Um, and if you are confused by anything at any point, feel free to say so in the chat. And um, yeah, we'll, I, I'm happy to try and explain it in a different way. Um, a brief note also, uh, we, history, the history of electrics and railways isn't the main subject of today's video but we will be touching on it here and there um, so I will be explaining stuff that has to do with history such as um, why Melbourne and Sydney run on a much lower voltage than uh, Brisbane and Adelaide and Perth uh, but yeah uh, should be good let me get my screen set up and we will get started. Ooh, that's a bit big. We're going to reduce that window a bit there. Because I want to still be able to see the chat. But. Still control things and blah, blah, blah. Right. And let's turn the webcam on. 
There we go. <clears throat> so, don't get too overwhelmed. We've got a almost 700 word document that I've used with a few diagrams and stuff, but we'll be going through this at a reasonable pace. Um, and yeah, I will do my best to explain everything as much as possible. Let's put that there. All right. So the first thing that you really need to understand about electrics is that there's two broad types of electricity. There's AC and there's DC, alternating current and direct current. Now, you've probably heard of those two things before, but what do they actually mean? Well, these diagrams here sort of show you. With DC, you've got constant power the whole time. It, it doesn't change unless you turn it off. Um, but with AC, it sort of goes up and down in a sine wave pattern. Of course, in Australia, uh, that's at 50 hertz or 50 times per second in the, and that's the case for 99% of the world. Uh, in the, the rest of the world, which is the United States and a couple of other lonely countries, uh, it's 60 hertz, but yeah doesn't really matter all you really need to know is that AC goes up and down up and down and DC just remains constant or I should say back and forth with AC because that's essentially what it is you'll notice here that it's dipping into the negative so it's sort of going the other way and it's yeah that you are, it's the change that really matters So here are a couple of basic equations and I'm going to explain them one by one. First is V equals IR. So what does that mean? Well, V is voltage, I is current, and R is resistance. This is really just to show you in layman's terms that voltage, current, and resistance are all directly connected to each other. And those are the three main components of electricity. Um, voltage and current are sort of the two most important ones and resistance is a sort of secondary importance. Still very important, but yeah. Um, so voltage equals current times resistance. Cool. You don't really need to know exactly how to use that just yet. Um, I will get to that later. Second equation that we want to understand is power. Now, voltage and current both have something to do with power, but power is the combination of them, right? It's voltage times current. Power equals voltage times current. <clears throat> Uh, and so, yeah, you can think of voltage sort of like um, if you think of a hose uh, or a pipe filled with water, um, voltage is sort of like the pressure of that water and the current is sort of like how much water actually is flowing through it. So you could have a very small pipe where not much water is actually you know like if, if you think about to, to fill up a pool or you know what since we since we're talking railways uh, a steam locomotive tender you could have a garden hose that's run at reasonably high pressure um, and the speed of the water might be quite high because the pressure is quite high but there's not actually that much water flowing through a hose. So it's going to take a long time to fill up a tender full of water. Uh, 
But on the other hand, you could have a very fat hose or pipe uh, that doesn't have that much pressure to it, uh, but there's a lot of water that can flow through that thick pipe. So that would be equivalent to sort of like a high current. And so it wouldn't take as long to fill up um, a steam locomotive tender. But yeah, power is the combination of the two. And we'll get more into that in a little bit. This third equation, um, in your sort of typical high school electronics class, which is really where most of this information comes from, um, this equation isn't really talked about until a bit later on, but I want to talk about it now because it's important to understanding uh, electrics in railways. And so this is saying power loss equals the current squared times the resistance. So that square right there for the current is really important because it means that if we double our power, we quadruple the power loss. So there's no way you can avoid power loss entirely, but there are ways in which you can reduce it, which is what we'll be talking about a bit later. Um, and so, yeah, just a little uh, key, I guess, here about what the letters mean and the units that we use. So V is for voltage and we measure voltage in volts uh, with the symbol V. And just as a side note, KV or kilovolts is just another way of saying a thousand volts. So if I say 25 kilovolts, I'm really saying 25,000 volts. I is current in the equations, but we measure it in amps with the symbol A, uh, or amperes is the really, uh, is the proper way of saying it, amperes, but uh, it's often shortened to just amps. Um, and why do we measure current in amps and label it A, but in the equations it's I? Don't ask me why. <laughs> um, that's just the, the convention. And so, yeah, while it's tempting to just use the units, um, yeah, if you, if you do want to continue with this subject, if say if you're uh, in high school yourself and you are thinking about maybe looking at doing physics and uh, wanting to learn a little bit more about electrics, um, then you'll be introduced to those letters. So it's a compromise. It's just something you've got to learn really. Um, thankfully, resistance um, is pretty straightforward. R, but again, um, you know, it's measured in ohms with that little thumb sort of symbol. Um, it's the Greek letter uh, omega, I think. I could be wrong. Um, but yeah, ohms is the uh, unit of resistance. P is power, of course, uh, but we measure it in watts with the symbol W. And of course you can have kilowatts, KW or megawatts, MW. But yeah, we'll just be working with standard watts, I think in uh, today's lesson. Looking at the chat, um, Stephen says, hell yeah, Gunzel Maths. Glad someone's excited. G'day, Albert, and g'day, Brian. Hope you enjoy the show. So, the first thing that I'm going to talk about, where it 
starts to relate to really relate to railway electrics is the current draw in 1500 volts DC versus 25 kilovolts AC. Why those two numbers? Well, because that right there is what uh, Melbourne and Sydney run on, 1500 volts DC, and that 25 kilovolts AC is what um, Brisbane, South Australia, uh, Adelaide, I should say, um, all of Queensland, not just Brisbane, um, and uh, Perth, Perth runs 25 kilovolts AC. Um, it's a more modern standard. And there are other random other voltage standards like uh, tramways tend to run on 600 volts DC. Um, you know, there were various mining, industrial, in, industrial mining, um, electric railways, uh, which ran on a few different voltages. Um, I'm not sure what your lawn ran on. I want to say 900 volts, but that's, I don't think that's true. It was a 900 millimeter gauge. That's where I'm getting the 900 from. I'm not sure of the voltage of your lawn. Anyway, someone can tell me what that is. Um, Roderick Smith says, twinkle, twinkle, little star, power equals I squared R. And that symbol is omega. There you go. Um, so, this, while it might seem like a new equation, it's not. It's just this equation right here. Whoops. It's that one right there, just written in a different way. So with any equation, we can sort of rearrange things while keeping the formula consistent in order to make it just a little bit easier for us to understand. So in this case, we want to take this formula here and we want to say, okay, well, what, what's the current like in that equation? Well, in order to rearrange any equation, it's a bit of simple algebra. Um, now that word scares a lot of people off, but really it's fairly simple, at least at this level. I'm, I'm well aware, I'm studying engineering, that algebra can get very complicated, but this is simple. Um, so we need to look at, okay, well, what do, what, what do we want? We want to get the I out as something separate. So what's it connected to? Well, it's connected to V. And so we need to somehow separate the V from the I uh, and keep it, but make sure that the power doesn't uh, get too affected as well. So because V is multiplied by I, we have to do the opposite. So the opposite of multiplication is division. So we divide both sides by V. Because whatever we do to one side, we have to do to the other side to keep it consistent. And so V divided by V is just one. So one times I is just I. So we can get rid of the I, get rid of the V, sorry. <laughs> we can just ignore the V on that side of the equation now. Perfect. Um, but remember, we have to do it to both sides. So we divide P by V, which is just, we just write as P over V. Well, you look at that. I, or you can think of it as V divided by V, which is one times i, so we just don't write that because it's just unnecessary, um, because one times i is just i. Um, one times anything is just itself. And 
we leave it as p divided by v, or p over v is another way of saying it. Cool. Now we can really use that to our advantage. And another way that we can put it is we can just do it if I write um, p, ignore this little way of writing equations. This is just how you type it out in pages. <clears throat> so that's another, just another way of writing it. P over V equals I. They're the same. They're just a different way of putting it. So here is our first example. A train is drawing 300 watts of power. How much current does it draw at the lower voltage, 1500 volts DC, and a higher voltage, 25 kilovolts AC? Well, we don't really have to worry about DC versus AC in this case because uh, these formulas are consistent no matter what the, whether it's alternating or whether it's direct. It's the actual number of voltages that matter. So we just plug the numbers into the equation. P over V equals I. So let's have P, well, 300 watts and divided by what's our voltage? Well, first it's 1,500 volts and that comes out to 2 amps. Cool. We've just solved our first railway electrics problem. Let's do it again. This time with 25 kilovolts. Remember, 25 kilovolts equals 25,000 normal volts. So 3,000 watts divided by 25,000 volts equals 0.12 amps. Okay, that's a lot less than two. So does that mean that the train is somehow drawing less power? No. It's the same power, it's just less current because there's a higher voltage. Hope you can understand that. Um, let's provide a different example, another example. <clears throat> this is a higher power train. So a train is now drawing 6,000 watts of power. How much current does it draw at the lower voltage and the higher voltage? Well, same thing. We plug in our power, we plug in our voltage, we get our current. And because there's double the power, there's double the current because we haven't changed the voltage. So four amps for uh, the lower voltage system and 0.24 amps for the higher voltage system. You can just plug these into your calculator. Um, you know, a lot of schools uh, and um, to, to a degree in university as well, um, they're against, they're a little bit against you using your calculator. And while there are some good reasons for that, in situations like this, just, it, you don't actually need to work out in your head what that is. Just put it into a calculator. <clears throat> um, the calculator will do the hard yards for you. Um, G'day, Melbourne and regional trains vlogs. All right. So now we've got an idea of the different currents and how if we've got a lower voltage, that means we get a higher current for the same power draw. Keep that in mind as we go into the next example. So in this example, number three, we're asking if the section of overhead wire has a resistance of 10 ohms, how much power 
is lost in the overhead wires during example one. Remember that power loss equals I squared R. Or P, <coughs> what did Rod say? Twinkle, twinkle, little star, power equals I squared R. Um, yeah. So again, we just take that equation and we plug it in. Uh, for a 1,500 volts supply, in example one, we drew two amps. So two squared times the 10 ohms resistance. Okay, 40 watts. That's how much power we lost in the system. 25 kilovolts, 0.12 squared times 10. Wow, okay, only 0.14, less than a watt of power loss compared to 40. Already you can see that it's quite a big difference. And that's because the, the current, sorry, was squared right there. Let's do it again. Example four. If the section of overhead wire is resistance of 10 ohms, again, how much power is lost in the overhead wires during example two? So this is, was the 6,000 watt train. Well, four amps for the lower voltage system and 0.24 amps for the higher voltage system. Plug those numbers in. Geez, now you're really seeing a big difference. We've doubled the current and we've quadrupled the power lost in both examples. Um, I know that 0.58 isn't exactly 0.14 times 4, but that's because of rounding errors. Um, but trust me, it's the power, the true power loss is double. Um, <clears throat> And so, yeah, the point is that, look, you know, we've still, we're st even with the higher power, much higher uh, current uh, power, power train, we're still drawing less than, we're still losing, sorry, less than a watt of power in the 25 kilovolt overhead supply versus the 1500 watt, 1500 volts, sorry. Um, power supply where we're using where we are losing now 160 watts so that is the one of the biggest reasons why 25 kilovolts is a more popular um, system a more popular voltage these days is because there's a lot less power lost in the wires now, the actual numbers here, exactly what they are, they don't really matter. What we're really looking at is the relationship and, you know, how it actually affects things. A true train will draw a lot more than even 6,000 watts. Um, and you'll have more than, 100, than just 160 watts lost in the overhead. But what will always remain consistent is that you'll have a lot more lost in the lower voltage system than the higher voltage system. So, hope that's all understandable so far. Roderick Smith says, Yulon was off the shelf mining technology, German mining technology, 1100 volts DC. That is something of a surprise, as I can't think of any up other application in Europe. If I recall co correctly, Switzerland had some 1200 volts DC. And g'day Josh, JS317 Productions. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, hmm. Well, yeah, so... With lower voltage systems like your lawn, you'd be losing even more power 
uh, for the same thing and you know trams 600 volts DC in Melbourne at least um, I'm not sure about modern tramway systems across Australia um, what voltages they use but Melbourne uses 600 volts DC um, the original Sydney and, tra and uh, Brisbane tramways uh, and Adelaide as well I'm pretty sure they all used 600 volts DC uh, so you'd be you're losing even more in those situations Hermans Journal um, well firstly Josh says am I late by much uh, not too late I mean you know you're half an hour late but uh, we're, we're still you know coming along oh okay 750 volts uh, for trams in Sydney oh okay 750 volts DC for trams these days in Sydney okay so Roderick is saying 750 is replacing 600 that's interesting I mean there's lots there's more than just power loss that goes into a decision into what voltage you use um, obviously but yeah worth mentioning and g'day Steph K190 I'm doing all right um, yeah and Herman's channel says Victoria sticking with 1500 volts DC is a blessing and a curse because it's like get with the times Melbourne but also never change we only just got the tape back yep I'll talk a little bit later on about um, why Melbourne isn't going to switch anytime soon uh, Roderick says 600 volts DC for tramways was very much a world standard and remarkable achievement <laughs> yeah getting any group of people to you know from such varied backgrounds to agree on anything um, we couldn't even agree on gauge I mean we're starting to now but yeah um, that's that's good to hear and g'day Sam everything is well for me all right so um, this is another big difference between uh, 1500 volts DC and 25 kilovolts AC is the distance between substations so firstly what even is a substation what does it do well they're generally unmanned um, that's the last point I've got there um, but they can be in not so much these days you s there's very few manned substations these days um, if any I, I don't even know of any um, but I'm sure they're around um, the, they're all pretty much unmanned um, these days uh, but a substation changes voltages um, it converts AC to DC uh, or vice versa but it, yeah that's um, really what it's doing and by change voltage it can either go up or down uh, <clears throat> and so it it also boosts the voltage and therefore the power because in overhead lines as the distance goes on you do get uh, a bit of what's called voltage drop um, the voltage changes slightly um, and therefore you uh, need to boost it <clears throat> in order to not let it drop down too much um, and 
yeah, if you've got less voltage, that means you have more current, which means you have higher power loss, remember. So it's important to do that. Um, that's another big thing that they do. Um, it prevents major damage to equipment if too much current is drawn. Um, in day-to-day -day operation, that doesn't happen, but when it does happen, it has the potential to go really badly. Um, so they will, substations will, what's called trip. Um, they will trip the breaker, which breaks the electric circuit, um, stops power from flowing and stops things from getting too damaged. Um, there's a great video on YouTube by, I think it's Practical Engineering. Um, if you just search for Practical Engineering substations, you'll find it. Um, goes into a lot more lots more detail than we can ever go to in this uh, session um, and yeah it talks about the various challenges of substation design and it's worth a watch if you are interested in that sort of thing but uh, just to give you a taster um, it deals with things such as uh, it's not as simple as just flicking a switch to break a high power draw um, but yeah, um, in a more uh, regular scenario, substations allow sections of overhead wire to be isolated uh, so that it can be worked on. Or if there's a, uh, say the, well, I'll give you a more real world example. How about this? A couple of years ago on the Sandringham line around Brighton Beach, a comment train pulled down the overhead wires um, in the middle of the night. Uh, caused a lot of havoc, but um, nobody was injured. Um, while there was a lot of damage to the overhead and a bit of damage to the train, um, if the current uh, wasn't if the substation didn't trip um, then uh, could have been a lot worse and when they needed to repair the overhead section after that comment had been towed away or pushed away I should say by a sprinter uh, a couple of sprinter rail cars that were going to be destined for Stony Point but had to be diverted to uh, push the comment interesting times but yeah that's um, sort of thing the sort of thing that the substation does so yeah as I said before in overhead wire as the distance increases so does the resistance and voltage also decreases which is called voltage drop so those two things are important to keep in mind. I'll read some comments before we get into the next example. Um, Roderick Smith says, the change is partially the result of the desire for peppier performance and coping with modern heating and air conditioning needs. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what's more interesting to me is that they haven't jumped up to an even higher voltage than 750 and they haven't gone to AC. That's another interesting thing. Because uh, just briefly, it's a lot easier to change the voltage of AC than it is DC. It's absolutely possible with DC, but it's a bit more of a tedious process. Put it that way. Um, JS three seventeen. I want to stay. I want to say, the substation at Flinders Street Station is sort of manned. There's always blokes around. 
Yeah, a lot of substations um, will often have workers around, but yeah, they're not, they mostly operate automatically and they're just there for sort of regular maintenance and just generally checking on things. Um, but yeah, uh, the day, in terms of the day-to-day -day operation of substations, um, not, not like they used to be manned, put it that way. I mean, the original substations were almost, well, they were smaller power stations. Um, and hence why the name substation. Uh, and in the early days of electricity, um, there was a lot more smaller power stations and substations around the place. Um, I mean, in the heart of Melbourne, there was a power station on Spencer Street for many years. So, <laughs> Ms. General says, I think when the overheads were put up in the 1910s in Vic, power was made at 25 kilovolts before uh, getting to the trains at 1,500 volts. I remember hearing that somewhere. It may have been the V-Line Power Parade. Let me check my notes because I think I mentioned something about that. Here we go. The original Newport A power station. Uh, this was from the museum's Victoria website. Uh, outputted 20,000 volts at 25 hertz AC. Um, so... Yeah, and then that was stepped down to 1500 volts DC and, um, well, I should say stepped down to 16, 1500 volts DC, volts, and then rectified to DC, rectified the 25 hertz to DC. Um, that's what it's called when you, when you convert AC to DC, that's called rectifying. And when you convert DC to AC, that's called inverting. Mm. Um, Josh says, Siemens on the Alterna line between Galvin slash Paisley, Paisley did the same in 2019 with his pandas. Yep, there's, uh, 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 there's a number of times when trains have pulled down the overhead. It happens occasionally. Um, yeah. And Aaron says, I've always wondered what happens if there is a lightning strike on one of the overheads or a train? That's an interesting question. Um, if there's a lightning strike, then uh, what will happen is the... The trains themselves have, will have special circuits and the substations will as well um, to deal with that. And essentially what happens is that the, it detects that there is a very high spike in current and it sends that straight to the ground uh, so it can be safely dealt with. Um, in a more serious lightning strike, um, the lightning could potentially induce current in other areas um, and could cause some other problems, uh, but substations and other things generally have it such that if it trips, it will break the power and then maybe wait five seconds or something like that, try and reconnect. And if it breaks again, it'll try again another couple of times. And if it still breaks, then it'll say, okay, that's it. Um, but that's, you know, it'll say that's it because, okay, there's obviously a more permanent issue. 
perhaps a tree has fallen on the overhead um, and brought it down. Um, but if it's a lightning strike, you just need to disconnect it the once and then the lightning's gone and so you can reconnect it and y your problem is not there anymore. Whereas a tree, you've obviously got to remove the tree before you, your problem is gone and you need the power to be off anyway um, to, um, to work on the overhead. <clears throat> Herman is way out. VR was a, says Roderick Smith, VR was a world pioneer of high voltage DC. Um, here there are just 600 volts DC trams in metros, southern region UK. Later, some systems upgraded to 3000 volts DC. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I guess. I guess now we can talk a little bit about uh, that, um, yeah, at the time, 1,500 volts DC was a pretty modern system. Um, VR understood the, um, the benefits of higher voltages. And so, yeah, went with the, what was at the time a much higher voltage. But electricity distribution itself was in its infancy and so we hadn't really worked out how to deal with ultra, ultra high voltages. Um, so yeah, although you could see that the Newport A power station put out 20 kilovolts, um, that was ultimately stepped down um, I mean it was never that far from the from the railways so you didn't it's not like um, the modern more modern uh, Gippsland power plants which need to transport power over a large distance and I'm not really sure off the, I don't know off the top of my head what say uh, Loy Yang uh, the Gippsland's more modern power station, I don't know what voltage they would output at. Um, but much higher than 20,000, I'll tell you that much. <clears throat> um, and Albert says, Sydney used... Uh, motor generator and mercury arc rectifiers for its railway substations in the early days. Yep, there's various ways which you can rectify AC to DC. Um, those are two examples. Um, it would shut power, if I recall correctly, if you're referring to the lightning strike, yeah, it would shut power temporarily. <clears throat> Herman's General says the 20,000 volts at 25 hertz would have been what I heard. It was some old archive vid. I'm not sure if it was the power probe exactly, but it was a video like it. Yep. Oh, circuit breaks will activate. I assume you're talking about lightning. Um, Brian Wilson also says, uh, wow, YouTube has just told me that Floyd, this bloke Floyd Bromley is live. Thanks, YouTube. Yeah. Um, yeah, Rod says we're jumping into part two prematurely. Tonight is just basics of electricity. Um, part of the issue is how to build traction motors. Yep. Um, Melbourne trams are at 600 volts, yes. And Rod Smith says just from memory, long distance transmission is 66 kilovolts stepped down to 22 kilovolts then to street applications okay yeah um so um <laughs> finally getting into example five um so 
If a piece of overhead wire drops voltage by 5 volts every kilometre, oh, sorry, we're just stating that. So a piece of overhead wire drops at 5 volts every kilometre. All of these numbers are carefully chosen by me so that the equations work out all right. Um, I don't know if it's a realistic number. As I said before, it doesn't really matter. It's just a number. And it's the relationship between them that really matters. So if a voltage drop of 2% is acceptable to us, let's say, what is the maximum distance between substations? Obviously, this will be different uh, for 1500 volts and 25 kilovolts. Well, firstly, we need to work out how much is 2%, right? So for 1500 volts DC, we just go 1500 times 0 0.02, that's 2%, equals 30 volts. Cool. So this tells me that we can drop the voltage by 30 volts before uh, on a 1500 volt system um, before we need a substation if this 2% number is to be the most acceptable figure. Uh, for the 25 kilovolt system well, 25,000 times 0 0.2 is 500 volts. Okay. So, you know, uh, that's a, quite a bit more. We can drop by up to 500 volts before we need to boost it. So, now we need to figure out how many kilometers will cause that voltage drop. Well, remember, we said 5 volts every kilometer. So we divide our acceptable voltage loss, uh, voltage drop, I should say, 30 by 5, which gives us 6. All right, so we needed, in this example, a substation every 6 kilometers. Sounds all right. For 25 kilovolts, uh, now we divide 500 by 5, which is 100. Okay. So, yeah. You can really see there that that's one of the reasons why 25 kilovolts has a lot longer between, a, a lot higher distance between substations because the voltage drop is, um, yeah, we a, a, a much, we can drop, the voltage a lot higher, a lot more, before we need to renew it. But I mean, why why this 2% to begin with? Well, I remember, if there's 2% less voltage, then there is 2% more current, because the power has to remain the same, but power equals voltage times current. So, we need them to balance each other out. And more current means more power loss. In fact, if we've got 2% more current, then we'll have 4% more power loss. Because remember, I squared in power loss. <clears throat> um, Albert is thinking like a Brit, says Josh, because he said good morning to James, who has given us a train emoji. So some other things I would like to talk about in terms of supply. I've um, talked a little bit about this converting AC to DC, which is called rectifying, and vice versa. DC to AC inverting causes some losses. Um, we, funnily enough, um, we convert the AC supply to DC, I should say the AC uh, transmission to DC supply for the trains, and then we often turn it back into AC for 
on, on, on board the train itself. But that's uh, a different kind of AC. Um, it's not 25, it's not uh, 50 hertz. It's not 25 either. Well, it could be, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Uh, transformers, that's what you use in alternating current, AC, to step voltage up and down. A lot of older electric trains, such as the Tates um, and trams, uh, used DC motors, which is the same as the supply, so you don't need to convert anything, don't need to lose any power. Uh, but more modern trains tend to have AC motors of some description. I'll talk more about motors a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot of considerations that go into um, why that's the case. Um, AC motors do tend to be more efficient than DC motors, but obviously you've got some losses in the inversion process. That's for the electrical engineers to work out uh, who are designing the trains. Is, is it really more efficient in the end to have AC? And a lot of the time the answer is yes. Uh, by how much? Don't know. That's proprietary information a lot of the time. Uh, so, Victoria and New South Wales run 1,500 volts DC. Queensland, South Australia and Western Australia all run 25 kilovolts AC. Why is that? Well, as we've said, basically they were built in more modern times when 25 kilovolts was the newer standard um, and we've talked about the benefits of higher voltages um, yeah it was um, and so if 25 kilovolts AC is better why does Victoria and New South Wales still use the old voltages well yeah, uh, short answer is cost. Uh, it would cost an enormous amount to, you would have to change or modify uh, every single train in the state, every single substation in the state. Um, you wouldn't really have to touch the power stations themselves, but yeah, you'd have to change all of the overhead wire. Yeah, it would cost a lot of money. And does it have its benefits? Yes. Does the benefits outweigh the cost? Not really. So, unless electricity gets supremely more expensive in the future, which on the scale of... Um, Railways, probably not that much. Um, so, Melbourne, Sydney, New South Wales, we're just going to keep living with 1500 volts DC. Um, and if we've talked about, uh, you know, how 25 kilovolts is more. Um, favourable to long distance railways. Why does New South Wales have a lot more electrified track compared to Victoria? It's mostly to do with history. Um, Victoria only really electrified the one line, the one country line, and that was of course to Terrelgan. Uh, reason for that was not so that passengers could have an electric train, no, no. It was so that they could have efficient haulage of the brown coal from Gippsland. Um, freight is always the reason for long distance electrics. Um, in the suburbs, yeah, electrifying can make sense um, because you've got a high frequency of trains and 
uh, yeah, you can, you'll end up spending less on electricity than you would on diesel. But uh, for long distance lines when the frequency of trains isn't that much, passenger trains isn't really the main reason uh, why electrification happens. Uh, with the exception being extending an existing line. Um, I'm busy. <clears throat> uh, and so, yeah, New South Wales had a lot more coal to haul and uh, the other thing is that uh, New South Wales ordered uh, electric multiple units compared to Victoria where we just used the electric locomotives which were really designed for freight and we just added them to the end of passenger trains and ta-da, you've got an electric train. Um, while there was some proposals to have electric multiple units for the Gippsland line, they never came to fruition. If they did, I would say that we would still have it electrified to 12 and today, um, but we certainly wouldn't be still hauling coal. Um, yeah, well, there's, there's a good chance it would still happen today. Maybe not guaranteed. Um, but yeah, New South Wales has chosen to go down the EMU path. Um, so that was the major re reason why when the coal traffic dropped on certain lines, the electric overhead was kept in New South Wales. I would say I'll catch up on this later. Have to go. Best of luck. All the best for the lockdown, Melbourne people. See you, Floyd. Thanks, Albert. See you later. Yes, it's 10 p.m. and we've still got a bit to go, but I think that the next section is less dense. So, um, yeah, I think I'll keep going. Roderick Smith says, conversion isn't impossible. Western India has done it over many stages. New fleets are built. Dual old fleets get scrapped eventually. The main issue is clearance under overline bridges. Yep. Conversion is always possible. It's just a matter of cost. Um, and I don't really see it happening in Melbourne or New South Wales anytime soon because I, I don't see any benefit. Well, okay, there is benefit, but not enough benefit to justify the cost. Um, just an, uh, a note while I think of it, um, the new proposed uh, suburban rail loop, you know, there's talks about it being entirely separate from the main suburban railways um, in terms of its operations. I don't think it's really been discussed yet what voltage it will run on, but if it is to be entirely separate, I'd say there's a good chance that it will be 25 kilovolts. Um, but we'll, we'll see if the whole thing even comes to fruition. I'm not convinced that it will. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's talk about a couple of different types of electric and semi-electric train, trains and trams. Um, explain the differences. So overhead electric, of course, that's what you'd normally think of as an electric train. Battery electric, you don't tend to see it on trains, um, at least not yet. Battery technology just isn't up there. Um, you do see battery electric on uh, some trams to varying success. Uh, Trams obviously have a lot lower power requirements than trains. Um, this is a more modern thing. 
hybrid overhead battery electric. So I believe Victoria's new F-class trams are proposed to have that sort of system where you've got a battery which sort of takes the peak of the load and the overhead which supplies the bulk of the load. Um, so by having the battery, you're sort of reducing the stress on the overhead wire so that it's sort of more consistent um, and yeah you can but yeah you, you I mean I guess I, th I think that there are some trains which are starting to do hybrid battery overhead um, but yeah nothing really is running in terms of trains is uh, not in terms of heavy rail at least is running fully battery battery electric we're only sort of just starting to see it in buses um, can have petrol or electric uh, such as the old petrol electric rail motors so what does that mean um, well it means you've got a petrol motor generating electricity which is ultimately used for traction Similar thing with diesel electric, of course, the petrol electric rail motors became the diesel electric rail motors, otherwise known as DERMs. And just about every diesel locomotive um, is a diesel electric. Of course, there are exceptions, but most of them are diesel electric. Same sort of thing. You've got the diesel motor creating electricity, which ultimately drives electric motors. Vanderbrick says, I seem to be a bit late. Hope I haven't missed too much. Well, you've missed a fair bit, but uh, stick around and we'll keep going. Um, hopefully you can keep up and otherwise you can catch up on the first hour um, at a later time. If you're wanting more. <clears throat> We've still got eight people watching. That's pretty good. Um, so, two different types, two, the two main types, I should say, of electric motors, AC and DC. Um, you can have a universal motor which will run on both, and you can, you obviously have uh, various types of DC motors and various types of AC motors. I'll run you through a few of the common ones, but... This is in no way a conclusive list. If it was, we'd be here all night. In AC motors, you have single and three phase. If we go up to here, this diagram again, um, this is single phase AC. Now imagine if you had that, except you had another one of those waves offset by a third of a wavelength and then another one offset by a third of a wavelength so that's what you have a three phase i should have uh, found a diagram for what three phase looks like but just know that it's sort of three of these combined into one and so you can get higher power um, three phase is more in industrial settings you don't really see it in railways and tramways. I think there's a couple of examples around the world, but it's rare. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, you can't see crap, but it's my dessert. It's a lemon souffle, as mum said. <clears throat> Um, brushed DC um, it's called brushed because there's little contacts made of graphite which um, are inside the motor which help to transport the electricity around the motor um, you do find them in modern applications but not as much anymore 
you definitely find them in old trains and trams. The biggest issue is that the brushes wear out over time, and so you've got to replace them. So you can have brushless DC. Um, the brushless DC doesn't have any brushes, yay! But they're a little bit more expensive because you've got to have extra control mechanisms. Um, you see them a lot in small electronics like drones and stuff. Um, drills, you know, uh, home power tools, that sort of thing. Brushless DC is quite common. Um, but yeah, especially on a large scale, if you need a DC motor, chances are you're going to go brushed. Um, AC synchronous. Let me have a bit of dessert and then I'll talk about AC synchronous. Mm. Roderick Smith has filled in Vandenbricks about what we've been talking about. Mm. Mm. Herman says EMD Locos did something odd. Dynamic brake bands were three phase. Phase is actually spelled P-H-A-Z-E. Uh, but radiators were just DC motors. So a C or G class was set up like that. Hmm. That's interesting. I wonder why the engineers chose that. Hmm. Roderick says, I was on a charter trip on the Essendon Aerodrome tram line when the driver tried to zoom off in 980. The lights went to brown and the tram didn't move. <laughs> yeah. There is a limit to how much power you can draw. Um, yeah. Hmm. Okay, so AC synchronous motors are pretty much exclusively three phase. You can have single phase synchronous, but that's a bit complicated. Um, all that it really means is that um, they spin up to a certain speed and they like to stay at that speed. Um, and then if you put some sort of load on them, they want to try and get back to that speed. They're always trying to get back to that speed. So it's great when you need a constant speed. Um, so yeah, used a lot in industry. AC induction motors, um, more efficient, uh, used a lot in electric cars and that sort of thing. You, s <clears throat> you find them a little bit on trains. Servo motors, they are for uh, when you want to move something uh, between different positions, largely at slow speed. You'll find servo motors on model railways, but um, and oh, I, I guess you could call them, you, you potentially see some variation of a servo motor to change a more modern, like a fully heavy rail point. Mm. Stepper motors, they are another form of motor where it's very easy to control their position. Um, with both server and stepo, servo and stepper motors, you can control their speed, but not as easily as a plain DC uh, motor, and vice versa. You can, can there are ways of controlling a DC or, or an AC motor for that matter, its actual position. 
but it's more complicated. Um, various others, as I said, the list is endless of electric motors. <clears throat> Tea or coffee, says Brian. Um, I am not a big drinker of either tea or coffee, although I do like a good jasmine tea. Um, don't have either tonight. While Floyd is eating, says Roderick, a lot of industrial and home workshop equipment is three phase 415 volts. Uh, that is what comes down your street lines. Domestic 230 volts is just one of the three phases. Indeed it is. A lot of people don't realise that. Um, that three phase is actually everywhere. And, uh, yes, you'll find that actually, funnily enough, um, a lot of, uh, like, uh, what should I call it, like, fair equipment, I guess. Um, I, my family hired a jumping castle once when, for my, I think it was my seventh birthday, and uh, they managed to uh, have a uh, AC synchronous motor. Um, I don't think the jumping castle ran on three phase because you'd have to um, convert, you'd have to do some work to make use of the three phase supply that exists on the street. Um, but yeah, um, a lot of, a lot of events and stuff will use, end up using three phase, uh, from the street, uh, if they need a lot of power. Um, yeah, and I guess I, I've heard that, um, if you have an electric car and you want to install an electric charger in your home, uh, sometimes they will wire that up into a three phase circuit. So something interesting there. The <clears throat> Herman uh, says, so they work like a governor, that's cool. I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to, but we'll talk about control mechanisms a little bit later. Um, so, with control mechanisms, mechanisms um, before control mechanisms, we need to understand series versus parallel in electrics. So, series is when everything is sort of in a line. Those two flat lines there are just indicating the source. Um, that's positive, that's negative. So current always flows from positive to negative, so current will go around this wire, through the motor, round through this motor, and into negative. Interestingly enough, electrons actually flow the other way around. Um, I'm not going to get into why that's the case, but um, just know that, that that's a little tidbit. Because um, electricity is made of electrons, of course. But that's irrelevant for today's discussion. The things that you need to understand in series the voltage is uh, added. So you've got part of the voltage on this motor, part of the voltage on the other motor, but the current remains the same. So you'll have the same current on both motors. So, I mean, in the most simple example, if this was a two volts DC supply, we'd have one volt here, one volt there, one plus one is two. So this is just saying 
the total voltage equals the first voltage plus the second voltage. Cool. And the total current is the same as the first current is the same as the second current. It, it's all the same. Parallel is the opposite. In parallel, you've got one circuit which goes around here. You've got another circuit which goes around here. Okay. The cool thing about uh, parallel is that the voltage is the same there oops, um, across this and this. And if you had a third one or a fourth one or a fifth one, it would always be the same. Um, parallel, the voltage is always the same across the different branches. But the current, the current is split. The current is, you'll have part of the current going through the first motor, part of the current going through the second motor. Um, and with motors, in the, in the most simple sense, you can think of the voltage as the speed of the motor and the current as the torque on the motor. So how much force is the motor providing? Um, so you could run it uh, in series. You could run these two motors in series and they would provide maximum current, but not maximum speed. Or you could run them in parallel and they provide maximum speed, but not match maximum torque. Um, which is, you know, force, starting, starting force. Think of it like that. <clears throat> uh, so keep that in mind as we go into the next example. So combinations, what happens if you have both? You know, here we've got six motors, which we can think of as sort of like a bogey. It could be a bogey. Um, this, uh, in this case, we've got um, three motors in series, but also three motors in series here. So we've got two sets of three motors. Um, we've got three S, three series, two parallel. That's what that is saying, the three S, two P. So it's just a matter of combining the two equations. So <clears throat> um, I probably should have put numbers on all of these motors, but you can think of this as one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, so the total voltage in the whole system will be split between the two, will be the same, sorry, across the two branches. But within the branches, it will be split between the motors. All right? Because in that part, it's in series, but in that part, it's parallel. And the current is the same. So the current will be split across the two branches, but within each branch, all three motors are getting the same current. Um, whereas if we had each of the motors in uh, just in series, uh, in parallel, sorry, um, then they would be getting a lot less current. So that's what I've just written down here. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, sorry, uh, plus four, five, six. That's one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, another example, 2S3P. So again, we've got two in series and three in parallel, three sets of parallel. Mm. Um, so as you'd expect, the voltage 
is the same across the branches. You've got one, two, three, four, five, six. But it's split within the branches. And the current is split across the branches, but is the same within the branch. So why put motors in series or parallel? Uh, in what situation? Well, when motors are starting from standstill, that's when they draw the most current because they're trying to produce the most force to get you moving. Um, so in that case, you'd want to have them in series so that they can have the maximum current. But as you get higher to a higher and higher speed, the current requirements start to drop off and you reach a certain time when uh, the voltage is now the limiting factor. So as I said before, higher voltages generally mean higher speed. So in that case, you'd want to switch over to parallel, um, which is what happens. Uh, I, I believe uh, in pretty much all locomotives that sort of switching is done automatically, but in older trams and a few older trains as well, um, that switching was done more manually. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's just something to keep in mind. Um, Robert Smith says three phase 415 volts is also the Australian standard for heading power on trains to run carriage lighting and air conditioning indeed. Um, and the channel was referring to the synchronous motors. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, you're right. It, yeah, it's sort of like a governor. Sort of. It, it's a bit different. Um, so, other random electric facts. Um... Newport A, as I said, outputted 20,000 volts at 25 hertz. Um, HCMT trains use VVVF motors, which is variable voltage, variable frequency. So they are AC motors, but not the traditional AC motors. Uh, it's... Uh, yeah, variable voltage, variable frequency. And ugh, there is a video on YouTube which better explains that, or shows it, I should say. Um, but I think if you just search for, yeah, VVVF motor, you should find it. Um, noise can come from the motors themselves, uh, the gears, especially when the gears are straight cut or the inverters, which is amplified through the motors. Just a little fact right there. Um, yeah, I've sort of talked about uh, ex a little bit about extending electrification. It's, a top it's really a topic for another day, but um, there is a, per a point where the cost makes sense and um, not only from a cost standpoint, but from a service standpoint as well. Um, that's why you hear talks about electrifying in Melbourne to Baxter, Melton, Windervale. Um, those are the main ones that are talked about these days. Mernda was talked about a lot, but Mernda's been done. Uh, Wallen gets talked about a little bit. But... How are we going for time? 10.30. Well, we're on the last page, so there's not too much to go. And as you can see, there's only really three things to talk about. Um, 
So, oh, let me just wait for the vacuum to pass so I can concentrate a bit more. Maybe I'll read some comments. Rorishma says, my memory is that on trams that was done by the notches. Some were series, some were parallel. Yes, indeed. Um, and that's what this diagram is going to be talking about. But firstly, we'll go to we'll talk about um, control mechan uh, sorry variable resistors. It's a fairly old way of controlling things, but um, it's effective. And in fact, variable resistors are used in a more modern sense. But we'll talk about that when we get to the final part. Mm. So, remember that voltage equals current times resistance. Well, we can, if we want to control how much force is on the motor, um, then we can uh, we can control the we already the voltage is pretty much set uh, but we can use a variable resistor to control the current now the resistance will affect voltage within the circuit so that's worth noting but we don't really need to worry about that for the moment um, yeah, I, I considered doing, talking about how resistance works in series and parallel and resistors, but that's getting complicated, so I decided against it. Um, so, yeah, this is just saying that we can control current with a combination of voltage and resistance. If you look at this and think, okay, if we've got a very high resistance compared to the voltage, then this number will be small, so current will be small. If we reduce resistance down to a very low number, then this number will be, this whole thing will be quite big, and so current will be big. So, in other words, to slow down, we need to increase the resistance but to speed up, we decrease the resistance. And so this symbol here, um, this square with an arrow through it, a rectangle I should say, that's just the symbol for a variable resistor. You might also see the square box, rectangle, whatever you want to call it, replaced with like a squiggly line. That's just another way of putting it. Um, but Roughly speaking, um, this is uh, how a variable resistor works. You've got, um, think of this like something you turn, and um, as you turn it more clockwise um, or anti-clockwise, depending on which end you've got wired up, um, it will increase or decrease the resistance because the current has got to flow through this middle terminal. So let's say we had this end hooked up and this end hooked up, but not this end. So uh, the current has got to flow through here, through here, through here, through here. But if that little arm was over at this side, for example, well, it's got to flow through a lot more of this black thick black resistive material. There's going to be a lot higher resistance, a lot less current. That's how a variable resistor worked. Uh, pretty damn simple. Um, uh, you only really see see them in these in this sort of analog circuit um, in very old trains and trams. Even, even the Tates and the um, W-class trams, um, 
they were using a they weren't using a variable resistor like that that is what we're going to be talking about next and um, sort of notched controller Roderick Smith says variable resistance was the standard for model railways in my youth way before Hitler was outraged when his model railway club changed to DCC its problem is heat accumulation true for trams too yeah um, with high resistance you comes high heat And that's why we've moved to other methods. Um, so, notched controller. How does a notched controller work? Well, first thing to note is that we've got these three resistors. Again, you might see them as just squiggly lines. Um, I've chosen them to, to label them as these boxes to make it a bit more uh, user friendly, I guess, just a little more, a little, little bit more understandable, less intimidating. <clears throat> so this arrow controls which part of the circuit we have connected. Over here, it's connected to nothing. So it's essentially like an off switch. Uh, we're not connected to anything, we're not moving. Uh, or we're not powering, I should say. Um, but we can either connect it to here, or here, or here, or here. Now, why would we want to connect them to various different places? Well, think of that as different notches on the controller. That could be notch one, two, three, four. You could have a lot more than four notches. Um, this is just a very simplistic example. Um, so, and I guess that could be a fifth notch, but yeah. Um, if, you've, if you've got a car and especially the older cars where you had the um, the little dial which you rotated to go one, two, three, four with a fan speed. This is basically what it's doing. Um, yeah, Brian has just said that, same as the switches on your fan. Um, it So what it's doing is if we connect it to this first line, well, let's look at where the current flows. It flows from positive through here, through here, through this arrow, through here. Okay, it hits, goes one, two, three resistors before it even hits the motor. So very high, high resistance. Why doesn't it branch off into here? Well, because that's not connected. Or well, same with here or here. It's got to be connected for the for the current to flow. Um, so that would be a very low speed. If we wanted to notch it up to two, well, now the current is coming along and it's skipping that first resistor. And it's just going through two resistors. Perfect. Now we've got a slightly higher speed. Again, we could go that one. Um, now you're only going through the one resistor. And so it's almost at full speed, not quite. Um, and just a, a little note, while these resistors here are often all of the same ohms, the same resistance, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be. 
although most of the time it is. Finally, you can connect it to this final one, which has no resistance at all. You can just go straight to the motor. The motor can run at full speed. Perfect. So that's how a notch controller works, basically. Now, as well as resistors, you could have these different notches um, wired such that uh, the motors will be in series or parallel, which is what Roderick Smith was talking about, um, especially on W-class trams. Uh, they were the, the last Melbourne trams to use that sort of notched controller uh, where the yeah it was controlling both the resistance and whether it was series and parallel. I thought about drawing a circuit diagram for that but that would be complicated and not really within the scope of this video so I mean I'm sure diagrams are out there if you want to go hunt for them or even try and come up with one yourself. Herman says, I've got to go, Floyd. I'll see you in a few weeks. Hopefully, if I remember tomorrow, I'll catch up on the end of the stream. Cheers. See you later. Uh, let's put that back to there. So final thing we want to talk about is the more modern way of controlling things, which is called pulse width modulation or PWM. The way that it works is that very, very rapidly it turns the power or the voltage, but consequently the power on and off. So that's on that's off, on, off, on, off. So in this case, we've got 20% modulation. So the voltage is on for 20% of the time. So essentially, we've only got 20% of the average voltage and average power. So yeah, that in on a human time frame, that all gets smoothed out. Um, and I mean, if it really matters to you on an electronics level, you can smooth it out, um, which happens a lot in computers. Um, but yeah. <clears throat> From memory, Rotary says, VR's L-class locos were also manually notched. I think they were as well. Um, but all mainline diesel electrics, including B classes, are automatically switched between series and parallel. Um, <clears throat> uh, so yeah, forty percent modulation, same idea, just you know, a bit more time. 80%, you can see we're covering almost the whole cycle. And at 100%, well, there's no change at all. Um, and I said that uh, variable resistors are still a feature of modern control systems, but in a different way. That little thing right there, a variable resistor, um, a small version of it, is also known as a potentiometer and so what it does is um, it provides a the, com the controller the potentiometer the controller sorry can look at the potentiometer look at how much resistance it's got which is sort of what position that your throttle is in and translate that into a PWN system. Interestingly enough, um, when one of my projects at uni was to design and build a robot, and my job was to 
do all of the electric works on the robot. And so I wrote a control program uh, for an Arduino, uh, which took a um, potentiometer reading um, and converted that into a PWM signal, which ultimately controlled the speed of the motors. Um, that was part of my programming and electronics training, although I, we didn't use a potentiometer in the final robot. All right, see you, Josh. Uh, says he's off, and thanks for the interesting stream. Glad you uh, found it interesting. Um, Stephen says, it is under a big tarp as I had to move it. Oh, wait, he's talking about, uh, there's a large frames diagram in Newport workshops at a Lecquerel, which is a circuit diagram for a tape or swing door, dog box, motor carriage, but as symbols to represent parts such as the pantograph. It's under a big tarp as I had to move it to clear the area around our 222B carriage. Uh, unfortunately, I did not take a photo. I think I've seen it on display before. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, wiring diagrams for that sort of thing are going to be a lot more complicated than oh, the little things that we're doing here. But this is a little introduction. Uh, Rod Smith says, the beauty of PWM, no electricity is wasted in the resistance systems. Resistors are using electricity, producing heat and not traction. Indeed. That's the biggest reason why we've switched to PWM controllers these days. Um, but also just because it's a um, more fine way of controlling things and it works better with digital and blah, 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 blah. So, yeah. All modern trams are PWM. Uh, and just a quick side note, um, in Victoria's uh, Z, A and B class trams, they all, and a few of the common, a couple of the common uh, railcar um, electric EMUs, they used a control system called Chopper. You may have heard of it. Um, that works in a much more complicated manner than even PWM. Um, can be very efficient, uh, hence why it was liked at the beginning, but ultimately PWM is cheaper and works almost as good. Um, in the end, it's better because it's cheaper. Um, but chopper control is actually a slightly more efficient than PWM. Because, yeah. Um, and a final note about PWM, uh, if anyone's interested in solar controllers, um, and is any, if anyone's done any... any, any um, uh, interest has taken any interest in solar controllers you may have heard that there's two types PWM and MPPT maximum power point tracking and you may have heard that MPPT is the better system and that PWM is just the cheap system and that, cheap, and that PWM actually wastes power that is true in regards to a solar system because in a solar system, if you need to reduce the voltage, you can reduce it in PWM, but um, you're essentially switching your solar panel off during that time that you're not, you haven't got it on with the PWM controller. So yes, you are wasting potential power. Um, an MPPT controller effectively reduces the voltage in a different way and ultimately increases current. Um, 
and so you get the full benefit of your solar panel. Um, but yeah. Uh, ben N says, hi Floyd. Yeah, you can hear the PWM carrier hum on the trams. There you go. And you, it's, although the hum that you hear on most of the trams, like the older trams, the Z, A's and B's, that's the chopper control system that you're hearing, not PWM. Um, yeah. From the C-class trams onwards, that's when we started using PWM. All right. 10.50. Thought this one would go on for a while, but uh, we haven't quite cracked the two-hour mark. But, um, yeah, glad people have stuck around. Um, glad people have found it interesting. And uh, there's been some great contributions from the comments. Anyway, um, thanks for watching this stream. Next stream is going to be on a Friday night, back to a Friday, 9pm, two weeks time, hopefully, although it might be an interesting one because theoretically, if lockdown doesn't get extended, if restrictions permit, I'm not going to be at home on the Friday night, I'm going to be in a chuka. Having said that, I'm going to bring my laptop, I'm going to bring my phone, I'm going to try to do a live stream. We'll see how that goes. And I'm thinking we might even do a cooking episode, which has been requested from Roderick Smith. Um, we'll see. We'll see if I can even do it. A lot of things need to happen. Um, but yeah, I'll hopefully be streaming from my campsite in Echuca. Should be interesting. All right. Um, oh, I, sh I should say, if I can't stream that on that weekend for whatever reason, then I will do a makeup stream the following week. I won't bother streaming at all on that weekend because I'm going to be away for the whole weekend. So yeah, just a note. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you on the next stream. Bye-bye.